Right, good morning, everybody. Oh, glad to see everybody's awake. That's awesome. So today is actually a little bit of a two-part series because I think I'm going to be back in about two weeks, right? And what drove me to kind of think about these two topics together because I find that we have kind of misplaced our emotions and how we live our lives as Christians, and we've kind of flip-flopped what we're supposed to do. Now, there are two emotions that I think that um, Christians are supposed to be known for, okay, two emotions. One is a kindness and a love that extends beyond comprehension and world's understanding, right? We're supposed to love. The second one is that we are very well known for our absolutely righteous anger. <laughs> to be angry at things that are not following God. Now, the issue is I have here is that after watching throughout this year, throughout the years I've been on this earth, throughout my own Christian life, I realized that my love and kindness and my anger are placed on two different sets of people, and it's imbalanced. I love to love other people who think the same way that I do. I love to love people at church who are like, I agree with you, you agree with me, we're one big happy family, right? It's easy to love that, right? You think this is bad, I also think this is bad, so therefore, yeah, we're on the same page, I love you. And then I like to grow angry at those that are in the world that disagree with what I believe to be, you know, the moral, righteous, upright, holy word of God that tells us how to live. And so I grow very, very angry at people, right, outside there, saying, how dare you not follow what God has established as the right rules for this world. And I grew up like this, right? My entire life has been, oh, you know what? Love people at church and hate everything else that goes against God. Okay, great, easy, right? People who agree with me, I love. People who disagree with me, I grow angry and I hate. And hate is a strong word, but sometimes we get to that point. Now, the issue is, however, when we read Scripture, we begin to think about this idea of kindness and love and also anger, even if it's righteous anger, we sometimes misplace it to the detriment of God's plan for this world. And I'll explain what that means, but before that, let's read a passage in Scripture, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verse 17 to the end of the chapter, verse 32. So I know that you guys have it awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm going to read this version here. So if you guys have your Bibles, feel free to, to turn to it. It's in the New Testament. It's part of the General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, GEPC, okay? So General Electric Power Company, that's how I remember it. And Ephesians chapter 4, can everybody see the screen? Yeah? Okay. Let's read together, starting in verse 17. One, two, we're going to start by saying the actual book of the Bible, okay? Not start with the words, so we're going to start with Ephesians, okay? So one, two, three. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. Now I say this and I testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, 
that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let me pray for us. Dear God, as we come before you, God, um, I pray that your scripture and your word would be apparent for our living. God, I pray that you would show us something um, that is deep within us, Lord God, and cleanse out all those things so that we may be able to worship you and glorify you with all that we do. May you cleanse our hearts and our minds, Lord God, so that we would understand what you want us to do, not what we want us to do. We thank you for this time. We pray for this congregation. May you continue to bless them. May you continue to grow them. In Jesus' name we pray. You see, so Ephesians chapter 4 brings about kind of this, this view of how you're supposed to live as a Christian. And it talks about two things, right? It talks about what you were before as a Gentile and then what you are now as a Christian. And the difference between the two, if you look at this, it says you must no longer walk as Gentiles in the futility of their minds, okay, the way that they think. For they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. And that ignorance, due to the hardness of their heart, they become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learn in Christ, uh, assuming that you have heard about him. And I'm going to go jump to verse 22. And to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, when, when God is teaching us how to live as Christians, there is a semblance of truth that has to happen within a person. Okay, so, uh, and, and this truth is the reverse of what was happening when you were a Gentile. Now, the difference according to Scripture between a Gentile and someone who is a believer of God Actually, if you read that, the verses in reverse, you kind of see the path, right? It says that your old self is corrupt through de de deceitful desires. Okay, deceitful desire. We'll talk about what that means. That deceitful desires is full of sensuality, greed, and practice of every kind of impurity, right? But then before then, in verse um, uh, 18, it says you have these things because your hearts have been hardened, Right? And your hearts have been hardened because why? Because you have alienated yourself from the life of God. You alienate yourself from the life of God. That is why your thinking is now off. So there's this progression that is written there, right? You have like you're alienated from God. You have a hardness of heart, blah, 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 blah. If you look at the cause and effect going backwards, you realize the reason why Gentiles are Gentiles are because they are filled with all this greed and malice and blah, blah, blah. But the main reasons why, because they've removed themselves from God. That is the direction that happens. And so then the key attribute of a Gentile, right, not someone follower of God, is the futility of their thinking, which is what we see in verse uh, 17. And then when, when we are told this, the point is no longer walk as the Gentiles in what? The futility of their minds. That futility of the minds is one that is governed by what? Greed. Personal greed. Desire. Because if there is no God, there is no afterlife, then you've got to get what you've got to get now, right? That's the mentality that the world has. That we do things because we need to get what we need to get now, right? If we don't, by the time that we die right, then all is lost. There's nothing left. So therefore, I need to get by any way possible, get what I want now. And so therefore, that makes my standing higher. That means I can have more money. That means I can pass it on to my kids, and they should take what they want. And that is the way the world works. But then in Scripture here, it says, believers, please do not do this. Please do not do this. What you should do is have the kindness and love and gentleness that he talks about before, uh, later on, right? And that kindness is then created in the likeness of God. And I'm talking from verse 24. In true righteousness and holiness, right? 
And then if you read that end of that passage, verse 32, sums up that section, says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Okay? So we know, and I'm, I'm saying things that everybody kind of already understands. God calls us to be kind and loving and to be modeled after Christ. Yet let me ask you something. Is your faith actually kind and loving? Or even in your uh, righteous anger and your, your disappointment with the world, have you drawn back into the attitude and mindset of a Gentile believer in the futility of your thinking? What do I mean by this, right? So uh, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a um, how I like to break down scripture, just in case you guys want to know. Whenever I read uh, scripture, one of the things I have to think and remind myself is that no matter what I read, I have to understand the context, and the context is that God will not break his character. So if my understanding of this passage, right, means that I have to break God's character, that he is fully loving, fully just, fully everything God, and he, he is the one who is, then I, I cannot understand that passage in Scripture that way. I have to think back and say, okay, does this break my understanding of who Christ is? And if it doesn't, I need to rethink what God's trying to tell me. One perfect example, right, is like, for example, like a lot of times recently there have been all these, um, these like uh, TikTok slash Instagram, like the trad wife, right, submissive wife. And I, when I look back at Scripture, and this is a touchy subject for a lot of churches, when I look at Scripture, right, and I look at it, I'm like, Okay, what does submission mean, right? Does it mean that God's like, God's like, everybody, you just have to be on the ground all the time and kneel before me and blah, blah, blah? No, the answer is really no. And I actually dug in more, and what's actually interesting is, um, you know how we teach um, Eve is, comes from the rib uh, uh, of Adam? Well, you should actually look up the word that is used of what God drew Eve out of. And it is, it, it's, it's not the word for rib. But, the, the, but the, the American English, the English translation of that is rib because it's such a small part, right? Well, what if, what if we started reading scripture and we said, oh, well, no, no, it's the part of Adam that he pulled out, full half, the piece of him, which is why God said what? Adam, it is not good for you to be alone, right? So therefore, let me create a piece of you that's, that'll make you whole. Stuff like that says, okay, well, what is the trait of God and do I break it when I read scripture? And so therefore, when I look at this, and I see this passage in Ephesians, right, I say to myself, what is God like? What is he teaching me? And the reason I bring that up is because of this. Um, after he talks about breaking the idea of being a Gentile, okay, in the futility of minds, he starts to talk about put away falsehoods, and then in verse 26, be angry, but what? Do not sin, right? Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your wrath. Give no opportunity to the devil. And then I started thinking, okay, I'm allowed to be angry, but what is the type of life that God calls me to be? And that's why when we look at verse 32, it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Then I start to think to myself, what is the trait of God that makes this a necessity for my Christian life? God is loving. God is kind. God is faithful. God is gentle. God is long-suffering. He's patient. All the fruits of the Spirit. And I think to myself, as a Christian, does my life fit that? And the answer very plainly is no. Now, I'm up here speaking, and a lot of times people see the speaker, and they're like, oh, man, he's such a holy guy, right? Like, the, the, to an extent, right? That's why God calls certain people to preach, and to, but, not, but other people can also be extremely holy, right? But when you look at someone's life, including my own, I realize that, man, a lot of my Christian life has been filled with what I assume to be righteous anger. But God calls me... Not to be angry, but to be kind to one another, tenderhearted. How does my Christian life now all of a sudden go against what God has called me? And that's tough to reconcile, brothers and sisters. 
it's tough to sit there and look at yourself and be like, yo, I am an angry Christian. How much kindness do I show to people? And how and when? Remember how I was talking in the beginning? Man, I love to love church people, right? Because we think the same way. You're like, you agree with me, I agree with you. We all love one another. Yay, easy, woo, right? You're not going to marry, get married to your worst enemy, right? You're kind of like in the church, or you're like, this is my best friend because we have the same goals, so therefore we, and that's the same thing with church. I go to a church, everybody thinks like me, so therefore I love them. So easy. But when you look now at the characteristics of Christ, when Christ died, did he die for the people that just loved him? Like he's like, hey, you guys love me, so I'm going to die just for you? No. He dies, and one of the final words he says is what? Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so if the characteristic of Christ is one of tenderness and kindness, then how is it that we, his followers, live such an angry Christian life and we think that it is somehow holy or righteous before him? I mean, I'm like you guys probably, right? I grow angry at injustices. I grow angry at topics that seem to go against God's word. And that anger leads me to the point where I say, hey, how dare you do that? You should burn in hell. And I step away and be like, hmm, bye-bye, God, deal with them, right? And that, that's easy for me to do because I can just say, hey, I warned you. Wash my hands, bye-bye. If you burn, then that's your fault, not mine. And I wash my hands and say, God, see, I told them, right? And if I were to go to God and be like, hey, I told all those bad people on earth that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that they're going to go to hell if they don't follow you. What else do you expect of me, God? I did what I was supposed to do. But then if I take my rule, I start to think about what Christ did, I realize, whoo, Albert, far, far, far from what Christ would have done. I still think with the futility of Gentiles' mind, why? Because that selfish desire and greed makes me want to be right about the things I believe to be true. So even if my motives are to protect God's integrity, protect scripture, to watch after morality, to watch after this, if the end result is not Christ-like, all of that continues to be futility of mind. See, we mistaken a lot of times when we think about Gentiles, we're like, oh, well, they don't care about God. We can talk about righteousness and holiness and still not care about God. I mean, the entire New Testament, when Jesus argues with Pharisees, that's exactly what the argument is. You guys say you care about God, but you care about morality and morals and ethics more so. I care about God's people, and therefore they then, what, crucified Christ. Because Christ wasn't following their idea or concept of what it means to be a child of God. They were still holding on to the futile Gentile way of thinking, which is what? My bloodline as an Israelite, my bloodline as a chosen person of God, my ethics, my morals, you must follow these rules, you must wash your hands, you must not eat this, you must eat that. And he goes through it, and Jesus Christ actually breaks those one by one. Like, think about it, right? Um, one of the things that I would be so depressed if I was Jewish, now that, I, that I'm, chi- I'm Chinese, Taiwanese, right? But if I was Jewish, man, imagine giving you pork. Like, Pork fried rice, pork lo mein, like, like fried pork, like, like pork chop over rice with sun tai and stuff like that. Like, ha, I would be so disappointed, which is why I love being a Christian, right? Because then Paul gets the sheet. On the sheet is all the unclean animals, and God is like, go ahead and eat. I'm like, yes, lobster and pork is on there. We're good, right? So, but the thing is, the, the Israelites were so angry at the fact that Jesus and his disciples broke these rules and they were, and Jesus argued with them day in and day out. How dare you work on a Sabbath by healing someone's hand? You're working. And Jesus is like, do you not understand what the Sabbath is for? And we read all these stories in the New Testament, yet the way we live that somehow still mimics the Pharisees. When someone talks about abortion, we get angry. When someone talks about taking the Ten Commandments down from a, from a judicial place, like from the, uh, the, the, the uh, courtroom, we grow angry. When someone disrespects the Bible, we grow angry. And then we look at ourselves and we say, yeah, 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 I, I'm defending you, God. And God's like, I can defend myself. I am God of the universe, buddy. It's like, you're, it's like your two-year-old trying to fight for you, right, against a bunch of, like, 
25-year-old's coming after you. You're sitting there like, hey, I, I got this little guy. You don't know what you're angry about. Step aside. Let God do his work. And when God says that, he's not saying that he doesn't need us. He says the purpose of your life is to be kind, to be tenderhearted, because the goal for Christ was to what? Salvation of the world. Not to make his morality number one on the list. That's what baffles me sometimes, right? Um, one of the things about America, and, and I love America, by the way, but one of the things about uh, Americans is that they want a God-centered government or like world or culture, whatever it is. And they forget that the very scripture that they read, man, Israel tried that. They, did they succeed or they fail? They failed. They failed to what extent? That they completely missed the Messiah that they were preaching about when the Messiah was born. Because they were so focused on worldly things. Save us from the Roman Empire, right? Deliver us from oppression. And they missed all of eternity. Because the minds were still in the form of what? A Gentile. Greed for us. How do I remain? And you know what triggered the Pharisees, the Sadducees, to eventually want to kill Jesus? Uh, in the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, one of the things that is uh, so interesting at the ad end of that story is this. It says, and many came to know Christ because of Lazarus. And immediately the words after is, and so the Pharisees and Sadducees planned to kill him too. And why would they kill somebody who has just been given a miracle from God? Because the futility of their minds, like the Gentiles, was about greed, was about power about what they wanted. And when we read Ephesians, and we con continue to read in chapter 4, the warning for the Israelites, I mean for the people of God, is this. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And what is verse 27? And it says, and give no opportunity to the devil. Not only is God saying, in your anger, like, just stop being angry. He says, no, it's okay to be angry. Don't sin. But if you continue to push on this path, which is against what I came to this world to do, then you are what? Giving space for the devil. It's that serious. That when you are with God, you're with him. But even if you think you're in the middle ground, like, hey, I'm just getting angry. I'm going to, you know, get a little angry. I'm going to push these people away. He says, you have given space to the devil. And this is hard us to think about, right? Because so many times have I had assumed righteous anger that was actually very unrighteous, and not only am I disappointing God, but I've also given space to the devil. And that then leads me to grow even more angry. And then I hate people who, who go against my Judeo-Christianity beliefs. And at the very end of that day, imagine me standing before God, and I'm like, hey, I defended your truth from Scripture, your morality. And God's like, great. How many people did you bring to Christ? And I'm like, uh, none. But I did defend your truth. He's like, then what's the point of you trying to defend me, right? If you can't even do the final job, which is to bring the world to me, what was the point of you getting angry? And then you do a little introspection. You realize it's for your own sake. And when it's for your own sake, then, then you understand what the futility of the mind that the Gentiles do. Because they get these things. And this is what I like to, um, I, I like to always point out, right? Morals and ethics, even for non-believers, kind of the same. Very rarely will you find somebody in another culture who believes in another god, or lowercase g, Who's like, you know what? Murder's okay. You know, stealing someone's other stuff is okay. No. You meet just about everybody in the world. Everybody's going to be like, hey, killing people, not a good thing. Stealing stuff from someone, not a good thing. Right? Lying is also not a good thing. If you want to talk ethics morality, man, we, we're, we're pretty shallow. We assume that everybody is like, oh, man, you guys are like the devil because you believe in a different God. You don't believe the same thing that we do. We believe that stealing is wrong. You're like, uh, excuse me? 
we believe stealing is wrong too. Like, what are you talking about? So then it causes us to then think, what's the difference between the morality of the Christians and the morality of the world? Why is one futility of the mind, but the other one blessed by God? Even though, for the most part, just about the same. Let me bring up something else. Muslims, followers of Islam, they don't drink alcohol. For a period of time in America, drinking alcohol was considered a cardinal sin. And now it's like, you know, acceptable, but whatever. But hey, how many Christians can say, no, 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 I also believe to keep myself fully sober for the sake of God, right? Kind of like everybody's a Nazarite, right? Hey, I'm going to leave my hair long. I'm not going to eat the fruit of uh, the, the drink of the, of the grapes, of the vine, so no alcohol. I'm going to keep myself nice and fit, right? Eating locusts and honey. How many of us can say that we are able and willing to follow God if God had given us that directive? Yeah, another religion is like, hey, don't touch alcohol. It makes people's minds wonky, and so therefore stay away. And that abstinence is actually praised in Christian circles, but we can't execute it as well as somebody who doesn't even believe in our God. Think about that. Then where's our morality? We can't be better than somebody else who believes in another God, so then what's the difference? And even if we are the same, morally, morally, ethically, no stealing, no killing, Ten Commandments, pretty good, pretty darn good, right? Then what's the difference? And the difference is that it says here, right? In verse 20, when he rebukes them, he says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Not learn the rules or the laws of God. It says, that is not the way you learned Christ in verse 20. Assuming that you have heard about him, and were taught him, as the truth is what? In Jesus. For Christians, when we live our lives, a lot of times we forget Jesus. We know him as the Son of God, as the character that we worship. We don't realize that what is inside has to be Jesus as well. Well, what do I mean by this, right? Because we're very, especially in more of like, you know, even in, especially in Asian cultures, right? We're very hierarchy based. I right? hear this like the dad or the, like the older grandpa, grandparents, and then dad and the mama. We were very hierarchical, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a method to the madness of top down, right? And we go there and we say, yeah, 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 we got to honor God. And so therefore, we love God the Father. God the Father gives you a rule. You say, I got it. I'm following it. Boom, give me my gold star. I did got 100%. We're good. We love that. What we have a lot of harder time <laughs> is God the Son. We say we follow Jesus. The same way that Jesus followed God's rule, and, we're, and then we think to ourselves, well, do we really? How often am I as kind as Christ was to a sinner? You, you think about the, what always intrigues me, absolutely intrigues me, is the conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman. Because everything Jesus says sounds so insulting. Like, think about it. Go get your husband. Oh, I don't have a husband. Yeah, that's because you've got five husbands. Like, who, what, what woman in their right mind would be like, oh, yeah, that's, that's such a nurturing and kind thing to say, right? But Jesus goes after her time and time again and points out her sin, and she stays and she listens. And I'm wondering to myself, if I said the same thing to a sinner that I know, how often would I be able to convert that guy versus get into a fight with that guy, right? If I was like, yeah, um, go sober for a day. He's like, well, uh, I am sober. It's like, no, you've been doing drugs for five years. Like, like, what are you supposed to say in a way that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman and somehow get away with it? That you point out the truth of the sin within somebody and they still look at you and say, you know what, he's got a point. That's hard. But what does that require? It requires love. For people who are parents, you don't realize you have the skill. Because when your kids do something wrong, run at them to kick him out of the house immediately. I'd right? be like, you're a terrible kid. Bam, get out of the house. You're five, I know, but you threw the, the cereal, so go out and find your own housing. If you don't, you don't pay your rent, you, you don't do that. You go to them and you tell them, hey, this is what you did wrong. They grow angry, they go, but you still endure until finally that little five-year-old, that little six-year-old, that little three-year-old, in my case, a two-year-old and a five-year-old, they come back and say, sorry, daddy. You're like, okay, it's okay. I know you haven't really learned a lesson, but I'll take your sorry and your apology anyway. And you're kind and you're gentle to what? 
Bring them back. Why? Because you love them. That is the attitude of Christ. And for parents, you know that very well. You're just not willing to do it for people outside your family, right? To be that patient. That when someone comes to you and says, I disagree with your morality and ethics, you say, ah, yeah, but let me try to tell you. And then spend the time and energy until they're finally coming to the agreement that, oh, man, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Almost none of us have that patience. There are some people in churches that I've seen who are very evangelical, very, very patient. And, man, I respect that. That you can spend, you know, five, ten years trying to convince a friend. Man, after six months, I'm like, yeah, if you don't want to go to church, whatever. I'm not going to ask you every week. I feel kind of bad. You've got stuff to do. I've got stuff to do. The 30 minutes it takes me to try to convince you, I could be doing something else, right? I'm not going to spend that time and energy, honestly, unless I really, really, really love them, right? If it's like, you know, an uncle or an aunt, somebody in my family, then maybe I'll spend more time every Sunday, like, call them up, hey, would you like to, would you like to? It's, it's funny because um, the example that I've seen this done is actually uh, my mom, right? We have a couple of cousins aren't really, like, they're about my age, okay? So my mom is older than me, as you know, like 25, 30 years older than me. And my cousins are younger than me. But she will spend, she spends, like, every couple weeks, she messages them on uh, either, uh, what is that, um, line, right? Or on Instagram, actually, through my phone. And she'll ask them, hey, did you go to church this week? And as an aunt who is older, she chases after them. And that is an example of someone who's, like, my mom could obviously yell at me, smack me in the head, and be like, you're going to church. And I'm like, okay. But somebody else, like, yeah, they're part of family. And then I saw more of this because one time, I remember, I was leading youth group. I am the youth group leader, okay? I am responsible for these kids and their well-being in church on Friday nights. And I'm supposed to be seeking out these kids. But honestly, there's just too much stuff to do. And you kids, you guys, kids take up a lot of energy. Hard to keep track of you all. So sometimes a kid will not show up for one week, or two weeks, or three weeks. And as the leader, I miss it completely because there's 40 other kids that are running around, right? So I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just get everybody together, and whoever gets sent, sent. You know who remembers? My mom. To what extent? To the extent of this, where there was a kid that was missing from youth group for three, I think three weeks or something like that. My mom on that Friday night, called up his mom and was like, where's your kid? (laughs) Okay, doesn't stop there. And she's like, oh, well, I don't know where he is. And uh, I'm not sure, maybe he's, you know, he said he was going out to play basketball, go to the park. So if it had been me, I'd be like, oh, okay, just tell him that I called because uh, we miss you at youth group, right? Now, this woman gets in the car, drives to their neighborhood, then drives around the streets until she finds him walking to the park and says, hop in, we're going to youth group. And of course, when Ai tells you you got to go, he's like, don't worry, I told your mom already. He's like, oh, okay. Hops in the car, goes to youth group. That kid started coming to youth group every single week after that. This woman, okay, is probably 40 years older than him. And she drags him off the youth group to youth group, not just a Sunday service, and that kid starts coming to youth group. That's the kind of dedication I wish I had, because Albert was sitting there, the leader, doing worship and stuff, and I couldn't even remember which kid showed up which week. But there's some people that have that kind of love and that kind of patience. You see, what we learn from Ephesians, right, is do what Christ wanted you to do. All that rest of that stuff, futility of the mind. Futility of thinking, selfish greed. You want to do it for yourself, to pat yourself on the back, to make sure that even if it's not to pat yourself on the back, but to fulfill the responsibility that you were given, that's all well and good. You did your 9 to 5, you did your Friday nights, you did your Wednesday prayer meeting, you did your Sunday. But God says it's not that. It's beyond that. Now, the reason why Christ brings this up, and uh, there's a coffee there, thank you, um, is that he goes and he talks about this, and he says this in verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, okay, falsehood, futility of mind from before, 
It says that each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. He says that if you have abandoned the futility of the mind of how Gentiles live, then what happens is that you begin to speak truth to one another. You speak truth, but in a way, what? That you are members of one another. Not in a way that I'm right, you're wrong. If you tell the pinky, right? Hey, you're injured. I'm the nervous system. I'm telling you, you're injured, right? You want the pinky to heal or else everybody hurts. But if you treat it the way Albert would treat it, I'd be like, pinky, you're injured. If you don't get your act together, I'm cutting you off completely. We don't need you no more. Then it becomes not Christ-like. But that's how we treat it, right? If you don't like it, leave. Bye-bye. We would never do that to our kids, right? We would never do that to somebody that we love. We want them to heal and to come back, and that is the way Christ taught. But he knows that when you start telling truth to one another, people are going to get angry. But he says, basically, that's okay, right? It says this, telling the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. In verse 26, it says, be angry, but what? Do not sin. So he says that once you've stepped away from being a Gentile-like thinking, and you do it for the sake of another, and you begin to tell the truth and say, hey, brother, you're sinning, or I'm sinning, I apologize, whatever it is, then you will get angry. But in your anger, do not sin. You can be angry, don't sin. Do not let the sun go down in anger, which is what? Hey, don't hold that grudge. You've gotten angry, you've made your point, but you love this person, so therefore, right? Perfect example is um, a lot of times when my wife gets mad at me, right? or I get mad at my wife. And we also were taught the habit from very early on, never sleep in a separate bed, unless one of you has COVID, right? Never sleep in a separate bed because what? At the end of the day, you're still married, bound by covenants. So therefore, each night, no matter how angry you are, right, you have to freaking get in the bed with them. She's going to steal the blankets a little bit. You're going to fight back a little bit. You're going to get a little angry, but both of you are going to fall asleep. And in the morning, it's a new day. That's what marriage is. Now, marriages start getting rocky when in the morning, you want to continue the fights, right? Excuse me, remember what you said to me last night? Oh, man, you're not going to have a good day, and the days after are just going to follow, right? But you say, that we're always, I was always taught, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Because why? Because the reality is, what is supposed to supersede all this anger? It's love and reconciliation. And that is the story of Christ, right? And so when he teaches them, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, he continues on and says, and give no opportunity to the devil. Because when you allow your anger to supersede the love and the righteousness of Christ, then the devil has foothold. It becomes very easy to, to manipulate. That's why so many Christians are so angry at non-believers. And they forget their job is to bring those non-believers to Christ, not to defend Christ's morality or ethics or scripture. Christ doesn't need us to defend it when, you know, someone from somewhere else decides to burn the Bible. Christ doesn't really need us to defend the image of Christ on a cross being profaned. Can we grow angry about it? Of course. That is our God, our Savior, our Lord. But the person burning still lives in the futility of their mind. Yet in the futility of their mind, God still desires that they would come to know him and one day believe. That is the gospel of Christ. That is why our ethics and our morality, while it's the same as others, becomes different because you have been taught in Christ and the truth is in Christ. He doesn't say that the truth is in the rules I give you, but in the person of Christ becomes the truth. And if that person of Christ is willing to sacrifice for himself, sacrifice himself for the rest of the world, who are we not to sacrifice? And the hardest thing to sacrifice is not really your life. It's your right to be right. That's why apologies are so hard, right? Like even if you're right, I mean, husbands, sometimes even when you're wrong or you're right, you still got to say you're wrong, right? That's tough. That's very, very hard. Honey, I'm sorry. What are you sorry about? 
well, you were wrong anyway, but I'm sorry I got mad, right? That, that's, it, it's still something that's so difficult for us to say, hey, my heart is still in love with you. I'm angry, but I still love you, and I want to reconcile. That is very, very difficult. But that's what Christ did. Christ was right 100% of everything he said. Everybody argued with him, yet he had to go back and be like, you know what, I'm going to die for you anyway. Like, if it was me, I'd be like, hey, good luck before God. Judgment throne is coming. Let's see who's right. That's why I love, like, part of me, I guess the evil part of me, says one day, man, God, I want to stand between each person I had a disagreement with, and you just tell me if I'm right or he's right, right, or she's right. Because at a certain point in time, I just want to know that I'm right, right? And I go there and with that attitude, but that's not Christ. But the scary part is we live our Christianity like that. We tell people what is right, and yes, according to Scripture, it must be right. At the end of the day, is God going to reward us for being right about that argument? Or is God going to reward us for each person that we bring before him? Two completely different sides of it. It's not that easy. You see, then after putting away falsehood, he takes it another step. He says this, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up. You know why Christ takes it to that? We, we teach our kids this so that they don't curse or, like, you know, they don't whine or complain, right? It doesn't work with adults. It works with kids, right? We tell kids, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And then we drive. We're like, ah, you cut me off, right? Like, it, why doesn't it work the other way, right? It should because he says, I'm going to bring it a step further. Not only are you to be kind to one another and tell truth, you are not to say a single thing that does not build somebody else up. Keep the rest of the stuff just for art sake of argument inside. Bow out of your mouth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, except that which is beneficial to the hearer in some translations, or in this one uh, is good for building up as fits the occasion. Not only does it build people up, but it has to fit the occasion, okay? You can't talk about something else from somewhere else. It has to fit the occasion. And what? Give grace to the hearer. Not only are you not allowing corrupt communication to come out of your mouth, but God says, if you are to be like me, you must also give grace to that, the person who hears. And that's why it's so crazy, his conversation with the Samaritan woman, right? Because he does this. He gives her the truth. She, for some reason, understands his intent is out of love and out of, not out of maliciousness, continues to banter with him, and at the very end, he gives her grace because he knows she has sinned, and she tells her of the sin, and he gives her grace to the point where what? She's like, I don't care about my sin anymore. She runs back to the village, tells everybody, hey, this guy knew all of my sins, and says, you got to come here. And the village who knows her, okay, normally if somebody is that type of person, you're not going to follow them, right? You're going to be like, oh, great. She's creating another problem. She found another man, right, at the well. No, they hear her, and they're like, Oh, that's weird. And they come and they meet Jesus. So the sinner of the village, the one that everybody looks down upon, forgets to be ashamed about her sin, but instead finds redemption and brings the rest of the village to Christ. Now, could she have said, hey, I want to keep this myself. These people have been ridiculing me for years. Now that I know the truth, I have eternity, forget them. Let God sort them out. I'm already sorted out. And that's the way we sometimes live our lives. We want to hide it. But in salvation, she goes, and this is the crazy part, that Christ speaks her in a way that is truthful. He gives grace to the hearer. He builds her up so that she is more now effective as an evangelist than many, many, many other people who have been following him for you know, the three and a half years. Before his disciples were good at evangelizing for him, this Samaritan woman brought over a group of people that the Israelites completely disdained. Think about that. That is the word of Christ. How does Christ do it? Now, we think to ourselves as we close this off, right? And we think to ourselves, well, when God calls us to be kind, to be righteous, to be holy, how do we do it? What should we do? And it stems from the idea 
of who Christ is. Christ is naturally sacrificial. He has the other person's well-being. And the one key is that the, uh, the way of thinking for the Gentiles was one that they were what? Selfish. I want what I want. I want my life to be like this. I want to be in a situation that, hey, I am able to fulfill my need and my desire to what? To be right. But if we think from the perspective of how we deal with kids, that's how we should deal with non-believers. Hey, I understand that you think that this is wrong. You think that we're forceful. Yeah, you're, you're kind of right. Church is tough to be around as a sinner, especially when everybody looks so perfect. Oh, they came to Christ. Everything's good. Nobody does anything wrong in church. And as someone walks in here, man, they're not going to be comfortable. When they assume that the people are holy, not that the God is holy. And so for us as Christians, we have to start thinking, well, how do we become now more effective to those that don't know Christ? Do we need to pick that fight? I heard a funny joke uh, recently. It has to do with marriage again because I love using that example. Um, he said that uh, this guy, this comedian, was saying that he asked his father, what is the key to a long-lasting marriage till death do you part? And his dad responded to him, never say the first thing on your mind. Never say the second thing on your mind. Always say the third thing on your mind. Because if you say the first thing, you're going to get divorced. If you say the second thing, you're going to sleep on the couch. If you say the third thing, long-lasting marriage. And for a lot of us, he was talking about how he went and his wife, um, uh, the joke goes like his wife put all the kids' food in a cooler. And when they got to their destination, hours and hours later, all the food had spoiled. So he looked at his wife. He said, hey, all the food spoiled. And she opens up. She's like, oh, my God, what happened? And he said, you didn't put any ice in the cooler. She says, it's a cooler, you dummy. Why do you need ice in there? The first thing pops into his head, fight back. That would end it. And the second thing pops into your head. So he said the third thing, which is, you're right, honey. What's wrong with this cooler? We should have it checked out. But a lot of times, I know it's funny, but a lot of times for us as Christians, when we stand before someone, someone disagrees with our ethics, with our morals, our first step, our first thing that we want to respond with in anger, in defense of God, right, will cause this person to walk away from God completely. The second thing we want to do, right, is more gently defend and kind of push it off and sometimes that may cause someone not to come to Christ for the next five years because of that bad experience. And so then we have to think through, and after we've thought through the process, on the third thing that we're going to say, we say, okay, I'm going to come to this guy, and I hope that he become a Christian. You know what? I'm not going to fight it like this. I'm going to speak truth, but in a way that causes them to come and understand I'm doing this lovingly. Not out of anger, not out of the desire to be right, I'll do it, and if they don't agree with me, it's okay. Because I'll have another opportunity. I haven't destroyed that relationship yet. And that third way of thinking then makes it so that churches can then bring more people to Christ. Now, for the youth, um, it's tough. The reason why I say it's tough is because when you bring a new youth member, right, you're now comfortable with all your friends in youth group. When a new person comes in, a lot of times it's a natural gravitation away. Like, you stick with what you know, so you leave that one person standing on the side. And if you have to think to yourself, if I do what I want to do, which is play with my friends, then I leave this person out. Maybe they don't like youth group. They don't come anymore. If I do second thing, which is kind of like, oh, just say hi and they'll walk away, then maybe they'll feel okay, but, you know, it's going to take a couple times before they get comfortable with youth group. But if I go and I do the third thing, which is difficult for me, putting away what I want to do, and I go and I include them with our group, I talk to them, I chat with them, I spend the energy to find out more about them, to not be shy around them, even though I'm naturally shy, then that person will continually come back to youth group. Well, it's hard. It's tough for adults, even tougher for youth. So brothers and sisters, it all has to do with that the truth is in Christ and who he is. We as believers need to realize that. It is not the rights and wrongs that God gives us. It is the person of Christ. And the person of Christ comes along with his characteristics, his traits, and his desire to save the entire world. 
And if we as Christians can start thinking like that, we're not going to get into the same type of fights. We're going to get into discussions, to scuffles, in order to drag this person who's wailing and screaming and against God has been hardened in their hearts. And when they finally come before God and he breaks that heart of stone, then we have another brother or sister in Christ. And that, brothers and sisters, is what God is more, most happy about. That is what drives joy in the kingdom of heaven. And so, as we talk about this, about the living life of Christ, uh, in two weeks we're actually going to talk about anger. When is it right to be angry, right? Because right now, remember, I talked about it's misplaced. We take that righteous anger, we apply it to people we got to save, and then we wonder why the churches aren't growing and why people aren't becoming Christians. Yeah, because we just drove them away. And then we are kind to people inside, and we rarely tell the truth to another brother or sister in love, right? Because we're, we're so kind. Why don't we be kind to people who are, should be searching for God and be a little bit more forceful for people who are using God's name in vain within the fellowship even sometimes. To remind them once again who Christ and whose God is. Because you're on the same playing field there. But we'll discuss anger and, and you know, rage and righteous fury late, uh, in two weeks. But the first thing I want us to think about is how can I be more like Christ when I discuss with other people? How can I remove the anger, the righteous anger, so that I can bring more people? And it's not easy. It's definitely doable. For you who has parents, who are parents, you do it with your kids all the time, pointing them in the right direction. Now we've got to use the same thing for those who are not believers, to be creative, to be patient, to be loving, to be kind, so that when they see us, they say, this is the body of Christ, and I want to be a part of it. And with that, let us pray. Dear Lord God, we want to thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that you allow us to truly have... Um, a different mindset and different life. We pray that we would not be selfish in our desires, always seeking to be right, always seeking to argue, and think that we are defending you, God, but that rather we would have the heart of Christ and the characteristics of Christ to reach out to the rest of the world. May we love others even when we think that they're unlovable, God. May you give us the ability to be able to go out and desire people's salvation, not just desire for someone to follow the rules that we follow. God, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, remove from us the ignorance that we have built within us to be hard-hearted against you, God, but that you would also instill us with your heart, which is uh, full of love and kindness for the rest of the world. God, I pray that we become more effective, that we are in a generation and a season that, um, that needs uh, the world to understand that you are the one and only way, the truth, and the life. We pray, Lord, for this congregation. May you continue to grow them. May you continue to bless them. In Jesus' name we pray.